Hi everyone, my name is Dan Vollmer. Today we will be discussing the principle and methods behind color and turbidity assessments for both in-process and packaged beer as part of Packaged Beer Analysis Module 2.6. Here is an outline of what we will be covering today. We will start by discussing briefly color formation during the brewing and malting process. Then we will discuss the physics behind light. This will set the stage for our discussion about measuring color. As always, a stepwise guide as well as a video guide will be provided. Outcomes for this module are that the participant will gain an understanding behind the principles of color and the methods used to measure it. Additionally, the steps involved in making these measurements and the use of these values to maintain consistent color in brewing will be addressed. Color formation in the process starts early on during malting, where color precursors are developed during germination and kilning. Color is mainly the result of interactions between reducing sugars and amino acids via the Maillard reaction. This is a complex series of chemical reactions that result in not only color formation, but flavor formation too. Some factors that drive the Maillard reaction would be pH values greater than 7, temperature and time, low water activity, and the presence of precursor molecules, which are the reducing sugars and primary amino compounds. For those of you that don't know, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, and they are ubiquitous in malt and serve as both color and flavor precursors. Color can also form secondarily from the oxidation of polyphenols from the malt, resulting in the formation of reddish-brown hues. However, it is primarily formed as a result of Maillard chemistry. Let's start the discussion of color measurements by first talking about light. Light is said to behave in two different ways, as a wave and as a particle. When I say behave, I am referring to the characteristics that dictate its function. In some cases, light behaves more like a particle and in other cases, light behaves more like a wave. For the sake of this discussion, let's say that light behaves like a wave. A wave, shown in the diagram in the upper right, has attributes that categorize it into a class based on energy level. The principal attribute of a wave is its wavelength. That is defined by the Greek symbol lambda and is the distance between two wave peaks. As the distance in this wavelength increases, the relative energy of the wave decreases. This can be seen on the diagram where radio waves have wavelengths that can be a thousand meters long and are relatively low in energy, whereas X-rays or gamma rays have very small wavelengths and relatively high energies. Today for the sake of color measurement, we are going to focus on what is known as the visible spectrum, located from roughly 400 to 800 nanometers in wavelength. Within this window, we get the colors red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Here are some color terms you should be familiar with. An object's hue is what we typically identify as its color, such as the block here. It is red. The lightness of an object refers to where it lies in the spectrum between dark and light. And saturation refers to the purity of color, and if it's a vivid red or a dull red. These are key terms that we'll be using in our discussion today about color. Now let's talk about the specific color measurement. This is based off the official ASBC method, Beer 10. The device we will use to measure color is a spectrophotometer. The Beers-Lambert law drives color analysis as we will be predicting the absorbance of a liquid sample. Don't worry too much here about the physics behind the measurement, just be aware that absorption is a function of a material's thickness, the concentration of the absorbing material, and the molar absorptivity value. The last one there, molar absorptivity, is an inherent characteristic of the object. Here's the schematic of a spectrophotometer. The sample is placed on the left, and light comes from the right and interacts with a cuvette that contains the sample. The sample is compared to a blank. Both the blank and the sample see the same wavelength of light, and the difference between the blank and the sample is what we are measuring. The ASBC has championed the formation of a single wavelength assessment of color. Color is the absorbance at 430 nanometers times the path length, or length that the light has to travel through the sample. Since most spectrophotometers operate with a 10 millimeter cell, some adjustments are made to account for the difference. The result is given in units of degrees SRM, or degrees standard reference method. So why 430 nanometers? First we need to talk about complementary colors. Every color that you see in the box here has its complement across from it. Red to green, yellow to indigo blue, etc. The wavelength associated with the complementary color is known as the wavelength of maximum absorbance. Because we are operating here at maximum absorbance, any slight change in concentration will result in a significant change in the absorbance of light. This occurs at 430 nanometers, which is the maximum absorbance for yellow, 
which, as you may know, is the color of some of the world's most popular beers. One of the challenges for beer color measurements is that there is no maximum or minimum absorbance. 430 was decided on, as I just mentioned, because of the large amount of beers found at this color. Here is a diagram of the colors of different beers given in units of SRM. This is a great chart showing you the spectrum of colors that are found in beers. Originally, beer color was measured in lava bond units. This scale was based on a visual comparison between your beer and the standard colored solution. This measurement has been since replaced due to a better understanding of color measurements. Some issues with lava bonds surround the dynamic environment of the standard color solutions over time, as well as the percent of people, particularly males, who are colorblind. Alternatively, a more thorough method of assessing color is being implemented by the ASBC. This one involves a slightly more complicated measurement. However, with the proper equations, a multiple wavelength assessment can be converted into a tri-stimulus value. Tri-stimulus, or three stimuli, refers to the way your brain interprets color. En route to your brain, color signals are coded as a brightness signal and two separate hue signals. Remember, hues are what we typically identify as an object's color. Commonly, this assessment of color is referred to the LAB method. Each letter refers to one of the three signals headed to your brain. The L signal refers to the brightness and it is scaled from 0 to 100, with white being a value of 100 and black being a value of 0. The A refers to the yellow-blue hues. Negative values here refer to a more yellow sample and positive values to a more blue sample. And lastly, the B refers to the red-green hues. Negative values here refer to a more green sample and positive values to a more red sample. As you can imagine, a sample that is turbid will not assess similarly to a sample that is clear and free of haze or other particles. There is a convenient way to check this using a multi-wavelength assessment. If the absorbance at 700 nanometers is less than the absorbance at 430 nanometers multiplied by a factor, then the sample is not turbid. If the value is greater, then the sample is considered turbid and must be filtered using membrane filtration or can be centrifuged to precipitate the solids. As we have covered in other modules, the similar techniques apply here. Make sure the centrifuge is loaded in a balanced fashion. With regards to membrane filtration, it was discussed in the first module in the context of microbial samples and concentrating them. This can be used here to collect haze particles to allow for better color measurements. So just a note here on dark beers. As you can imagine, the darker your sample gets makes it more challenging for the spectrophotometer to interpret the absorbance. There are a few strategies to overcome this problem, however they can introduce some other issues as well. The first solution would be to dilute the beer sample. There is some concern here with regards to this being a true interpretation of the color, so the dilution should be consistent each time the measurement is completed. There is some evidence to suggest that dilution could cause a change in the pH, offsetting the buffer system, actually changing the true color. Again, if you're going to go down this route, ensure that the dilution is consistent and includes the least amount of water possible to get your measurement. Alternatively, and at a cost, the cuvette used to make the measurement could have a shorter path length, and this might mean you have to purchase a new cuvette. There are cuvettes that have path lengths of less than 10 millimeters, and these don't require any dilutions and will probably give you the best interpretations of true color. Now we will cover a stepwise guide to color measurement. First we will collect our sample, degas, if necessary, calibrate our spectrophotometer, load the sample, take our measurement, and then use the spreadsheet from the American Society of Brewing Chemists to gather our calculated values. Only 50 mils of sample is required for this analysis. Additionally, you will need two clean, dry cuvettes that fit path lengths in the spectrophotometer. When working with cuvettes, it's a good idea to use Kim wipes to remove any smudges or fingerprints that are on the clear surface of the cuvette. You will notice that of the four sides of the cuvette, two are frosted glass and the other two are transparent. Be careful to only handle the cuvette by the, the frosted sides. Samples will need to be degassed for this assay, as bubbles in solution will cause misrepresentations of color due to light scattering. You can pour the sample back and forth or use a sonicating device. Here at OSU, we will be using a spectrophotometer that can make multiple assessments of wavelength on one sample during one measuring run. Before we get to that, we need to get the device in control by setting the baseline and starting our calibration. The operation of the photo spec is mainly controlled by the computer and the corresponding software UV probe. To begin calibrating, place empty, clean, dry cuvettes in both ports in the photo spec and close the lid. Go to the software now on the desktop and click baseline. 
and wait for the machine to respond. Once the baseline has been set, it is now time to load the sample. Remove the front cuvette only. This is the sample cuvette. Rinse the cuvette with sample three times and then fill it. Clean the outside with Kim wipes and then load the sample. Close the lid and move over to the software. With the lid shut, press the start button in the UV probe software. You will hear the machine start up and the data will begin to populate the cells in the UV probe software. When the measurement is complete, highlight the cells and copy the data. The ASBC has prepared a spreadsheet including the calculations needed for many different assessments of color as well as the check for turbidity. Paste the data in column B in cells B7 to B87. Record the calculated values that you need. This spreadsheet is available as part of the official methods of analysis provided by ASBC. Included in the recorded calculated values are LAB, ASBC in value of SRM, degree SRM, EBC color, which is the European Brewing Congress color value, and again the single wavelength absorbance at 430 and 700 nanometers. Here is a short video of me performing the color method. Hi everyone, my name is Dan Ballmer, and today we're going to be going over color and turbidity analysis using the photospectrometer. So the first step here is to collect our sample and we want it degassed for this analysis because any excess bubbles will cause scattering of light inside the meter. To begin with, we need to take our two cuvettes and make sure they're both clean and dry. And we want to calibrate our device. So inside the machine there are two slots. We want to make sure that the clear side of the cuvette faces the machine, uh, faces the measuring part of the machine before we close the door. Now, as I mentioned, the first step is to calibrate the device. So we're going to be using the computer software here to set the baseline. And because this machine can take many different measurements at multiple different wavelengths, we're going to set that baseline between 380 and 780 nanometers using the computer. So here we're going to click on baseline. 780 to 380 and the machine's going to run and zero out um, the analysis at those wavelengths. All right, now that our machine is done baselining, we can load our sample. So open the lid and take the first of the two cuvettes out, leaving the back one in the machine. And right now we want to take our sample and we want to fill our cuvette carefully and rinse. I want to do this three times, and on the third time, fill to the top, like that. We want to clean off the edges using a Kim wipe, Kim wipes only, not to scratch this glassware. And as you can see here, the cuvette has a clear side and a frosted side, and you want to be careful to handle it only by the frosted side and not to make any smudges or fingerprints on the clear side. Now once we have our cuvette full, we can put it back in the slot, shut the lid, and now we can take our measurement. So again, using the computer software, we want to click start, and it will make its run through the wavelengths. Now that the data is collected, we can copy it into the ASBC spreadsheet used for color analysis. Now this spreadsheet includes all the formulas that you'll need to get the LAB, ASBC color values. So we're going to select our raw data column that we just collected, copy, and paste it into the percent transminutes column B. And as you can see here, it will spit out all the values that we need for our LAB, our ASBC color, as well as the check for turbidity of our sample, as we discussed earlier record these values, and then that's it. Thanks. Let's briefly talk now about color and beer quality. If you were to open your favorite light American lager, and it happened to be colored like it was a Northwest Cascadian ale, you might think twice about drinking it. But maybe you wouldn't. I like to think of color as something you will only really take notice of when it's wrong or doesn't meet your expectations. Brewing quality, consistent products means every last detail, from the bitterness to the alcohol to the color, must be the same every time. Otherwise, you risk not meeting the consumer's expectation of your product. The Porter Stout example, I think, really drives this point home. Stouts are typically opaque and very dark. 
quarters, on the other hand, can be slightly translucent and colored dark brown. Keeping these lines defined with respect to color is huge when you are trying to make a certain style of beer. In an experiment where identical beers were taken and different levels of color were added to not affect flavor but only appearance, the results of the study indicated that beers with more color taste different according to the consumer when in fact they don't taste different but your brain is telling you otherwise. In terms of quality, consumers typically associate higher color with higher degrees of quality with respect to ales. In an experiment by Trena and Bamforth in 2004, Budweiser was colored to varying degrees up to that of an amber ale. Consumers believed that the darker samples were of higher quality. So to wrap up this module, let's talk about some of the high points. First and foremost, color is an important measurement that is essential to producing consistent brews that meet your consumer's expectation. Color precursors are formed during the malting process. More on this in the additional reading section. It is the standard method to make the color measurement at 430 nanometers, and this is by the ASPC standard method, Beer 10. Lastly, LAB tri-stimulus values offer a comprehensive evaluation of color that can be used for precise calculations in blending in an offline setting. When you come to Oregon State, you will get hands-on experience with a spectrophotometer and be able to work with the ASPC spreadsheet to calculate color values. We can also discuss the origins of color in the brewery, as well as the issues surrounding beer quality and color expectations by consumers. To wrap up now again with your outcomes, the participant will gain an understanding behind the principles of color and the methods used to measure it. Additionally, the steps involved in making these measurements and the use of these values to maintain consistent color in brewing will be addressed. That's all for today. Thanks.